It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is to the Premier. Uh, last night, the Canadian government announced they had reached an agreement in a renegotiated NAFTA. Can the Premier share with us details of the briefings that he's received and any concerns that he's raised as Premier of Canada's largest province? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Leader of the Opposition, our full briefing, as I think everyone knows, is going to happen at 11 o'clock today yeah. with uh, Deputy Premier and Minister Jim Wilson. Uh, we'll be able to update you in the future, but I will tell you, we are going to stand by. We're going to stand by the agriculture industry, our farmers. We're going to protect our farmers. We're going to make sure we protect the aluminum and steel industry along with the automotive industry. That is the backbone of Ontario, and we will continue to fight for our farmers, for our auto workers, for aluminum and steel workers. We will make sure that there's going to be a fair deal here, here. with the United States of America. We'll make sure that we hold the federal government Response. accountable. As you know, Mr. Speaker, we weren't involved in the trade talks. We're going to have to rely on the federal government to tell us the deal. Once we find out the deal, I'm sure everyone else will know about it, and uh, we'll have further uh, words after that. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the, the Premier joined me at the international plowing match this year, um, promising farm families that he would defend supply management in NAFTA talks. And as he knows, supply management has helped farm families secure decent, reliable incomes. Uh, and they're concerned today that the system that uh, uh, the system is going to be undermined by this new agreement, Speaker. So, uh, one family, uh, one dairy family, particularly called it, "quote the slow death." of supply management. Uh, so perhaps the Premier can tell us exactly what he's planning on saying to the federal government about the challenges facing farm families. Premier. Well, I think this is the only time uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, we're going to agree on something with the Leader of the Opposition. We're concerned too. We're very concerned about the farmers. We're concerned about supply management. We're worried about the federal government throwing the farmers underneath the bus. We're concerned, but we're going to stand up for the farmers, along with the automotive industry, the aluminum industry, and the steel industry. Final supplementary. Well, despite last night's agreement, uh, steel and aluminum tariffs are going to remain in place, and these tariffs, as we know, have already had a devastating effect on working women and men, not just in the steel industry, but across the manufacturing sector. Uh, so perhaps the Premier can share with us what exactly he'll be saying to the federal government about ongoing tariffs. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, if that's the case, because we don't know 100 percent yet until 11 o'clock. We're calling on the Trudeau Liberals to compensate our farmers, to support our steel and aluminum workers and our auto industry. They need the support of the federal government. We weren't at the table, or maybe the deal would have been a little different, but it is what it is, and we are again calling out to the Trudeau government to compensate the agricultural industry, specifically the dairy industry, the farmers, automotive, steel and aluminum. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, uh, my next question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Trade. There's no doubt that while many are breathing a sigh of relief about reaching a deal, there are many others who will be left behind in this new agreement. So my question is, uh, not dissimilar to what other provinces have done, particularly Quebec, is the Minister bringing forward transition assistance to help the industries and families that will be hit hard by this new agreement? Minister of Economic Development. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, for, for the question. It's a, it's a good question. It is the responsibility of the federal government to compensate in international trade deals. And as the Premier just said, we're we'll pushing them and are pushing them and have been pushing them. That's why we went to Washington to make it clear that if they did throw the farmers under the bus, they better pay the billions of dollars required to make our farmers whole again. That is a federal responsibility under the Constitution of Canada, and you're darn right, I say to the leader opposite, we're going to hold the federal government's feet to the fire and make sure they don't let our farmers down.
Supplementary. Well, Speaker, many farm families will be hit especially hard by any concessions on supply management. And so my question is, uh, what is this minister planning to do by way of assistance to farm families? Minister. Thank you for the question again, Mr. Speaker. It, it shouldn't come to that if the federal government lives up to its trade obligations, Mr. Speaker. It's not the Ontario taxpayer that should be on the foot the bill for a federal negotiated agreement. That's not the way our country works. That's not the way our constitution works. That's not the way nine other trade agreements work. So I say with respect to the honourable member across the way, we intend to stick to the way this country was put together by our constitution, which puts the onus on the federal government since they negotiated the deal to compensate. They have put forward $2 billion, Mr. Speaker, and they've said that several months ago, but a lot of that money, as far as I'm aware, none of that money's flown. So it's nice they put it in a press release. Now they've got to walk the talk and look after our farmers, our auto sector, and our steel and aluminum sectors. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum are devastating not just to our steel industry but across the manufacturing sector. A lot of people rely on those sectors for good jobs, uh, speaker, speaker, for well-paying jobs. When the U.S. first imposed tariffs, the government of Quebec stepped up with programs designed, designed to aid small manufacturers in those industries. Ontario still hasn't responded, Speaker. When will the minister be rolling out assistance and in what form will it take? Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I say to the honourable member, it is the responsibility of the federal government. We will hold their feet to the fire, and you're absolutely right. The 25% tariff on steel has hurt, uh, hurt many of our industries and, and it has potential to affect many jobs. But it's also hurt uh, Ford, uh, Ford U.S. reported last year that that tariff alone and the aluminum 10% aluminum tariff has cost Ford in the U.S. a billion dollars. Honda and my Al in Alliston, who are building a new paint shop, which is a uh, steel frame building with aluminum siding and aluminum venting throughout, it's cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the federal government said they would look after these industries. We're going to make sure they do. They've set two, two billion aside so far, and uh, we're going to make sure they flow that money. That's part of today's phone call. Thank you very much. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, for the Premier, but it's a little bit worrisome that um, we saw no aid from the province on steel and aluminum, and now we have supply management coming down the pike, and I'm just worried that uh, this government's not going to it respond to the farm families that need help. The opioid crisis is killing people on a daily basis, Speaker. Families coping with the addiction of a loved one know that the overdose prevention sites save lives. They were expecting a decision on proceeding with overdose prevention sites last week, a decision that has now been delayed yet again. They want to know what is delaying the decision on the opioid prevention sites. Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. In fact, the decision has not been delayed. What has happened is we have applied to the federal government for the extension. The extension has been granted. And right now, I'm finalizing my recommendations to the Premier's office. That will be done within the next short while, and there will be another announcement very soon. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, everyone knows the Premier is capable of moving quickly on policy matters, and this is one where he actually needs to do that. People are dying every single day that this decision is delayed. Can the Premier explain to the people who are gathered here today and who were outside this morning how long it will take them to make a decision that could save countless lives? Minister. Well, the Leader of the Official Opposition is correct. We are losing too many people to the opioid crisis. It's something that we take very seriously over here, and we want to make sure that we do it right. We want to make sure that if this, these um, overdose prevention sites are continued, that they serve the purpose. One, saving lives, of course, but secondly, getting people into the rehabilit rehabilitation and treatment that they need, which includes housing, which includes services. There's a lot to be encompassed in this decision. It's not one thing, it's many things, and we want to make sure that we do it right. That's why I'm continuing to make my recommendations to the Premier. We're finalizing those recommendations, and more further comments will be made in the very next short while. Thank you. Next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indig Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I know our government is committed to building strong relationships with our First Nation partners. We want to help our First Nation partners open up new economic opportunities and help their communities thrive.
Our government is already taking steps to help make sure we are building relationships with First Nation communities. However, we know there are many historical challenges that impact these communities. I'm confident that Minister Rickford has the experience and knowledge to handle this important file. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain to the legislature what state steps this government has taken to address some of these challenges? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Perry Sound Muskoka for his question and his interest in these matters. Uh, late last week, Mr. Uh, Speaker, I had an opportunity to visit two communities that are quite proximal to where I live in Kiwaitan, two communities known to me in my previous professional capacities as both a, a nurse uh, and a lawyer, and certainly serving as the Member of Parliament, uh, those communities on a number of other challenges. And we wanted to make sure that these challenges became opportunities. So I was delighted to join uh, with the two chiefs of those communities, Chief Turtle and Chief Pache, uh, as well as Regional Chief uh, Roseanne Archibald. Uh, we had some great discussions with the community, and I reaffirmed our commitment on behalf of my friend and colleague, the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, that we remain committed to the English Wa uh, and Wabagoon Rivers Remediation Trust, and that it's fulfilled, Mr. Speaker, and the cleanup of the Response. river will go uh, and be finished. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, a government that is truly for the people must work to acknowledge and address the concerns of Ontario's First Peoples. I'm proud to be part of a government that is working to help keep that promise. I know that Minister Rickford's experience and leadership will help us create strong relationships with our First Nations partners. Our government has already taken action to ensure that local communities have the support they need to access services when they are needed. Can the minister tell the members of this house any other actions that the government may be taking to help the people of Grassy Narrows and Wabasimong? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, our uh, our journey to those uh, to Grassy Narrows First Nations included some other activities. One that's very important to a certain uh, number of people in that community and should be important. Uh, to all of this. Mr. Speaker, uh, our government has taken immediate action to ensure that more than 200 people who receive mercury disability payments uh, in, from these two communities are properly compensated. For far too long, these benefits have been frozen in time from some 30 years ago today. So I announced as of Friday, Mr. Speaker, that these uh, benefits will be indexed. And not only will they be indexed, but they will be indexed retroactively, Mr. Speaker. It's simply unacceptable that more than 200 of these people who uh, receive these benefits uh, receive such a small amount. The communities were Spons. very appreciative of this, and Chief John Pat Pache, I gave him this medallion, and he asked me to wear it in this place to signify and express his appreciation, here, here. Mr. Speaker, for our government's action. Next question. Start the clock. Member for London West. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, the recent census showed that one quarter of working-age Londoners have dropped out of the labour market altogether, more than any other city in Canada. Now, a new documentary from the London Poverty Research Centre reveals that fully half of Londoners who are working are in non-standard, unstable jobs. This includes Francis Henna, a father of four with two Western University degrees. Francis is doing everything possible to find work in his field, but is barely surviving on his minimum wage job. Speaker, an increase to $15 would have made a huge difference to Francis and his family while he struggles to find work. Why is the minister turning her back on Francis and the thousands of Ontarians like him? Minister of Labour. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and I appreciate the member's question. And we do want to help people like uh, Francis and his family. We made a commitment to keep the minimum wage at $14 an hour because it increased 20% this year. We want businesses to be the job creators, so there is more job opportunities. We want good-paying jobs in the province of Ontario. <laughs> and we are. Uh, creating a climate so that businesses can succeed and create jobs for Mr. Francis and his family. So we believe that uh, we were elected, we know we were elected, to make life more affordable 
for people in the province of Ontario. So helping businesses create jobs, making life more affordable to the people mm -hmm. in Ontario, decreasing their high rates, decreasing the price of gasoline, canceling cap and trade and carbon tax. We're reducing the burden not only on individual people but on businesses, so they can succeed, Mr. Speaker, and create. Well, Thank, you. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the minister, Speaker Stuart Clark is 50 years old and was laid off from his IT job about five years ago, working contract to contract ever since. The average rent for a one-bedroom apartment in London is $980, which means that Stuart is spending more than half his monthly income on housing. Since 2005, London has lost 5,400 good-paying full-time jobs, while our population has grown by 7%. Food bank usage in our city is up 30 per cent over the past decade. Can the minister explain how rolling back workplace benefits and protections will help contract workers like Stewart to make ends meet? It won't. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the uh, opposition party supported the previous Liberal yeah, government yeah. that made life more unaffordable, that made the use of food banks go up. You supported life being unaffordable and hurting businesses throughout the province of Ontario. And it's time for a change. And we were elected to make that change. Yes, we are going to make Ontario open for businesses. We're going to help businesses succeed, and we're going to bring in good paying jobs to the province of Ontario. So let's make Next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Last evening, the federal government and the United States reached a last-minute trade deal. The new agreement, called the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA, comes after months of uncertainty, uncertainty that left many business owners and workers concerned about the future. Could the minister outline what steps this government took to defend the interests of workers and businesses in this province? Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Oakville. From day one, our government, under the leadership of Premier Doug Ford, has offered our full support to the federal partners throughout trade negotiations. Our number one priority was making sure a deal got done that protected Ontario workers and industries. Premier Ford and Minister Wilson travelled to Washington a few short weeks ago to meet face-to-face -face with members of the Canadian negotiating team, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Canadian and American ambassadors. They reiterated that any deal must protect Ontario workers and industries, including steel, aluminum, agricultural and auto. Our government knows that in order to create jobs and protect jobs, Ontario must be open for business. This is dependent on open and fair trade with our largest trading partner. Our government will be speaking directly with industry representatives from Ontario Steel, Aluminum, Fonts. Auto and Agricultural sectors to, de to determine the impacts. We've been standing up for the people, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you to the honourable member for uh, outlining what steps this government took to get a deal done. Many businesses and workers in Ontario depend on free and open trade with the United States. It is great to hear that our, the work our government did to protect jobs in Ontario. Our government has heard from businesses that it is hard for them to remain competitive in today's business climate. Could the minister please provide the current status of the United States-Mexico-Canada trade agreement? Are you taking Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. As mentioned before, our government has been standing up for the people since day one and will continue to do so. It is more important than ever to open Ontario for business and create and protect good jobs for the people. We are pleased to hear an agreement in principle has been reached. It has always been our position that a renegotiated trade deal is in the best interest of all parties. It's critical to hundreds of thousands of jobs in Ontario. Speaker, our team right now is uh, gone to receive the full text of the deal and will speak directly with industry representatives from Ontario Steel, Aluminum, Auto and Agricultural sectors to uh, determine the impacts of this deal. 
We are calling for assurances from the federal government that any sectors in the province that are negatively Response. affected by federal negotiating decisions will be provided financial assistance and transitional support. support be, uh, speaker. We need that to protect our economy. Thank you. Next question, the member for St. Catharines. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. The government is putting the health of Ontarians in jeopardy. While we ask for even more time to receive evidence, we already have an overdose prevention sites. These sites work. These sites save lives. And this is exactly why we unanim unanimously voted in favour of bringing a safe injection site to St. Catharines while I was on City Council. Will the minister admit that the evidence is already clear? Overdose prevention sites work, and we need one to tackle the growing opioid epidemic in St. Catharines. Minister Finance. Thank you. Uh, well, as uh, was outlined by the Minister of Health uh, a few moments ago, uh, the extension that has been granted uh, was, pa was paused for three sites. The Toronto Overdo Overdose Prevention Society uh, <clears throat> was holding a vigil this morning, uh, and, and there is a uh, uh, the stakeholder. Oh, sorry. The uh, announcement on Friday was that we received uh, an extension from the federal government for the uh, three paused sites. The government is committed to get people struggling with addiction, with addiction the help that they need. Speaker, we are reviewing the latest data, evidence, and uh, current drug injection sites. Uh, and we're, uh, our health minister continues to speak and consult with experts, health care workers, police services, community leaders, business owners, stakeholders, Spons. and reviewing the re uh, reports to ensure people struggling with addiction get the help they need. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I didn't hear St. Catharines in there, and I think that's what the question was about. Niagara saw a 335 per cent increase in opioid overdose in two, between 2016 to 2017. There were 76 overdose deaths in St. Catharines last year, up from 40 deaths the year before. While these deaths are tragic, they are also preventable. If just one of these lives could have been saved by administering naloxone or testing for fentanyl, the overdose prevention sites would have been worth it. When will the minister do the right thing and approve the overdose prevention sites in St. Catharines that was already promised? Minister uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, again, that I can tell you that we are, uh, Speaker. S speaker, let me just tell you a little bit about fentanyl and what we've done in the past. We have brought in our Patch for Patch program that has done more to save more lives uh, with fentanyl than it, you can imagine. In my city of North Bay, where we had 15 deaths. 15 deaths in my city of North Bay alone before we brought Patch for Pat Patch in. The Minister uh, for St. Catharines come to order. The Minister of Many Things <laughs> also brought a bill in, a private member's bill in, that was uh, to strengthen education. Uh, we also brought a bill in to stop the, uh, to ban the illegal pr uh, pill presses. You know, these are all of the various processes that are all part of a bigger program. It's incrementally they're all important, but collectively they are part of a bigger picture to tackle the opioid crisis that we know needs so much work. Thank you. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Ottawa Vanier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour le My question is for the Environment Minister. The Environment Bill of Rights was adopted in 1993 and is a primary tool for all Ontarians to be consulted on environmental matters. It's premised on the right of all Ontarians to have a say on their environment and its future. 
Initially, the ministry had decided not to post Bill 4 on the Environmental Registry for the reason that the government had won the election and that that was sufficient consultation. Obviously, this interpretation would gut the Environmental Bill of Rights, since any future government could always say any government, any development, any change without ever posting on the EBR. And I'm glad that I understand that after a lawsuit uh, initiated by Equal Justice, the government has finally decided to comply with the EBR. Can the government, can the minister assure us that this government intends to continue to comply fully with the letter and the spirit of the Environmental Bill of Rights and does not intend to water down its requirements? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, and thank you for the question. Uh, the member, the member is, is right on two counts. Uh, this government was elected with a clear mandate, a clear mandate uh, to get rid of the cap-and-trade program of her, of her government, uh, to uh, return affordability to Ontarians, to, to have a more balanced approach to a healthy economy and a healthy environment. Uh, the member is also right that the Environmental Bill of Rights is an important piece of legislation, a piece of legislation that uh, this government and this minister will respect and that, uh, that we do, uh, as we have posted Bill 4, will continue to use it and other vehicles to consult with Ontarians when it relates to important environmental matters. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. I'm reassured that there is a commitment to the rule of law in environmental matters. But I'd like him to continue to explain then why the one billion proceeds from the cap and trade that was obtained in the auction before the election is not being used for the legal purposes for which they were obtained. Indeed, they were in fact in trust for the reduction of emissions. So I'm asking the minister, why does he need to dispose of these auctions in the way in which they were collected to help people, like in my riding, that need to have social housing being refurbished to protect the environment and reduce the emissions? Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. Uh, let me assure, assure the member and the legislature that um, the funds that were collected under the previous cap-and-trade program are being used for the orderly wind-down um, and, in some cases, the completion of some programs that were contracted with. Responsibly, the government, after it ceased to collect cap-and-trade revenues, as we promised the people, has no longer extended the program or extended the, uh, the costs and the expenditures associated with that program. But the revenues that were collected uh, for that program will be used for that. That is uh, specified in the legislation, uh, Bill 4, that is in front of the legislature, uh, and that is how we'll proceed. Thank you. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Over the past few months, our government has taken action to reverse the damage caused by the reckless spending of the previous government. It's clear that the Liberals ignored the reality of Ontario's finances, giving us higher taxes and higher spending and higher debt. In order to protect our core services and our future generations from an ever-rising debt load, we must act, and we must act now. The reality, Mr. Speaker, and experts are in agreement, is that the Liberals' out-of-control spending cannot continue. In fact, last week, the Parliamentary Budget Officer's Fiscal Sustainability Report 2018 painted a dire picture of Ontario's finances. Can the minister please inform this House as to what the report said and what we are doing to take the parliamentary budget officer's conclusions seriously? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and to the member from Eglinton Lawrence, I can tell you exactly what the parliamentary budget officer said. He warned us that, quote, fiscal policy is not sustainable over the long term. Quote, for years, the Liberal government ignored warnings from experts about Ontario's unsustainable spending, the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry, the line by line, and now the parliamentary budget officer's sobering report all point to one conclusion. We need to take action. That is why we're working to restore accountability and trust in our province's finances. That's why we're putting more money in people's pockets. We, and that's why we're sending a message to the world that Ontario is open for business. The people of Ontario finally 
have a government working Spons. for them and not a moment too soon, Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his response. It's truly shocking that instead of talking about Ontario's soaring debt and how it threatens core public services, the NDP continued to ignore all the warnings. The NDP stood by and watched happily as the Liberals recklessly increased spending. In fact, even though the parliamentary budget officer just last week said that our fiscal policies were not sustainable, as the minister said, the NDP was in this House that same day asking that more money be spent. Just last year, the financial accountability officer warned that if nothing is done, quote, the burden of stabilizing Ontario's public finances would be increasingly shifted from the baby boom generation to younger Ontarians. Can the minister please inform this House how reckless Question. it is to ignore the warnings about the province's debt level and how we must respond? Minister. President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the man member from Eglinton Lawrence for the question. Uh, there's been endless warnings from experts, uh, including myself in 2009, about the provincial debt and out-of-control spending. The most recent report from the Parliamentary Budget Officer reaffirms, uh, that, we ha uh, reaffirms that our provincial debt is out of control. Um, we have reported to the public through, as the minister mentioned, our line-by-line -line review, our public accounts, commission of, of inquiry. In all of these, we told the public and this legislature that current spending and debt trends are unsustainable. The PBO agrees with us. The Financial Accountability Officer agrees with us. The AG agrees with us. This isn't ideology, Mr. Speaker. This is about simple mathematics. We will fight to reduce the debt so that we leave a legacy of financial sustainability for this and future generation. It's too bad that the NDP won't work with us. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Today on the West Lawn, a vigil was held by faith and community leaders, healthcare professionals, harm reduction workers, and the family and friends of the 1,265 Ontarians who lost their lives due to the opioid crisis. They are looking to the government for answers. But this government has established a pattern of ignoring the facts, and it, that has to stop now. When confronted with the evidence that there are opioids leaking into the streets from Ontario's pharmacies, the Minister of Health shrugged off her responsibility to prevent these crimes. Speaker, how many more lives have to be lost before this government steps up to the plate and starts fighting for the people of Ontario affected by the opioid crisis? The Acting Premier. Well, Speaker, first of all, I abs we, we absolutely disagree with the, any part of that question, the premise of that question, Speaker, and the accusations that are made. This government is absolutely committed to get people struggling with addictions the help that they need, Speaker. We're reviewing the latest data. The, we're re reviewing the latest evidence. And we're reviewing the, the uh, current drug injection sites, the supervised injection sites and the overdose injection site models, Speaker. Our minister is speaking and consulting with experts, as I said, Speaker, in health care workers, police services, dealing with experts in the community leaders, business owners, stakeholders, reviewing the reports to ensure people struggling Spons. with addictions speaker can actually get the help they need. Supplementary. Back to the acting premier. We know most pharmacists are law-abiding caretakers that work hard to improve the lives, lives of their patients. But the unfortunate reality is that a few pharmacies were the source of great harm, flooding our streets and contributing to this ongoing public health emergency. Despite a Freedom of Information request showing that 17 pharmacists distributed more than 10,000 maximum strength oxycodone pills each last year, there is no indication that the province looked into why this happened. Speaker, is the Minister of Health going to get to work making sure these crimes never happen again, or will she continue her pattern of sitting back and letting communities, families and individuals struggle to save lives of, on their own? Acting Premier. 
Speaker, Premier Ford was very clear during the election campaign that we will listen to the experts and commit it again over and over to the $3.8 billion in mental health addiction and housing supports over the next 10 years. Speaker, that includes $1.9 billion from the federal government and $1.9 billion from the provincial government. Speaker, we have been consulting with groups right across Ontario. I know in my hometown I have been asking them, please help us identify the way that this money can be best spent and best put to use. I know that uh, our Minister of Health is actively leading this process. She has toured multiple sites, Speaker, heard from people Bonds. with lived experiences, uh, and she has been continuing to meet with health care workers, police workers, and we will continue, Speaker, to hear from the people. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Last night, the federal government and the United States reached a free trade deal, now referred to as a United States, Mexico, and Canada agreement. The USMCA comes after months of uncertainty and tariffs, tariffs that have placed an enormous strain on Ontario's businesses. While the agreement is a step in the right direction, I understand that it does not remove the remaining steel and aluminum tariffs. Could the minister please discuss what is being done to address these tariffs? The Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and to the member from Carleton. From day one, Speaker, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, has offered our full support to the federal partners throughout the trade negotiations. Our number one priority was making sure a deal got done that protected Ontario workers and Ontario industries. While we are cautiously optimistic that the USMCA agreement will create continued opportunities, we remain concerned, Speaker, about the remaining steel and aluminum tariffs. These tariffs have cost business thousands. Take Honda Canada for, as one example. These tariffs have cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to date. We need to create and protect good jobs here in Ontario, Speaker, and our government will, at, at the moment, will be speaking directly Spons. with industry representatives from Ontario steel, aluminum, auto, and agricultural sectors to determine the impacts of this deal. Thank you. Supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the minister for outlining the steps this government took to get a deal done. Many businesses and workers in Ontario depend on free and open trade with the U.S. It is great to hear the work our government did to protect Ontario's jobs. Our government has heard from businesses that it is hard for them to remain competitive in today's business climate. Could the minister please inform the legislature of the next steps regarding the implementation of the USMCA? Minister. Uh, thanks, Speaker, and to the member. Our government has been standing up for the people since day one, and we will continue to do so. It is more important than ever to open Ontario for business and create and protect the good jobs for the people. Once again, we are cautiously optimistic that the USMCA agreement will create continued opportunities, and we remain concerned, Speaker, about the remaining steel and aluminum tariffs. Both Ontario and our partners to the south succeed when we can, when we can create uh, trade easily. Speaker. Ontario does $389 billion worth of trade with the U.S. So while we wait to receive the full text of the deal, we're calling for assurances from the federal government that any sectors in the province that are negatively affected by federal negotiating Spons. decisions will be provided with financial assistance and, tra and uh, transitional uh, support. Our government will continue to, be, to vigorously defend and advance our interests. Thank you. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. During the election, the Premier said 
and I quote, he would leave no stone unturned when it comes to selling off Ontario's public assets. Following the election, the Premier commissioned a quickie report from a private consultant that recommended monetizing public assets. That's the same code for privatization that the previous Liberal government used just before they sold off Hydro One. Instead of speaking in Liberal code, will the minister just come clean with Ontarians and just tell them whether he is considering the sale of public assets like OPG, OLG, or the LCBO. Minister, President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member. Thank you for that question, uh, Mr. Speaker. Our government is working day and night to restore trust and accountability to Ontario's finances. While the NDP believes that the government can rack up unlimited amounts of debt without consequences, the reality is it cannot. In fact, the report in the 48 pages does not refer to the OLG or to the uh, OPG no, or up. the LCBO, make it up. so OMG. In, Mr. Speaker, we know the Liberals— I got it. All right. Took a second, but I got it. Mr. Speaker, we know the Liberals left us a mess, and unlike the NDP, we are working to fix it for the people. We have fixed the public accounts. We have fixed it the, with the Auditor General with the first clean opinion in three years. Yes. Our Response. government's priority is to ensure financial stability for future generations in this province. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. Members take their seats. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So the Conservatives were all for hydro privatization for over a decade. In fact, they started this entire fiasco. Yep. Then the Liberals did what the Conservatives had wanted to do, and when the public pushed back, the Conservatives pretended that they were opposed to privatization all along. But as recently as four years ago, under one of their many previous leaders, the Conservatives were touting a white paper, a white paper that proposed to quote monetize Ontario power generation and Hydro One, unquote. And the paper was crystal clear that this meant sell-offs and privatization of Ontario's public services. The white paper was signed by then energy critic, who is now the finance minister. I think it's incumbent on this minister to be very clear with the people of this province. Is OPG and the sell-off of OLG and LCBO Question. on the table? Tell the people of this province. President of the Treasury Board. Uh, Stop Mr. Stop Speaker, our attention. government has been working hard for the people of Ontario and has been restoring trust and accountability to government. EY had a mandate to consider all options and present those to government. They did an excellent job and left no stone unturned. While the opposition has been breathlessly fear-mongering, we have been looking yep. for solutions. The line-by-line -line audit presented some solutions to government. Just because an option was presented to the government doesn't mean it will happen. What I can say, Mr. Speaker, is this. We are not pro-privatization. We are pro-the people. Here, here, here. Every choice we make will be to modernize and trans transform government for the people so that they can continue to receive high-quality public service now and into the future. Here, here. Thank you. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Centre. Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Five years ago, the Auditor General released a report concluding that the Drive Clean program outlived its usefulness. Almost 15 years ago, the minister who founded the Drive Clean program called it to be phased out. On Friday, in Etobicoke, the Premier and the Minister of Environment announced that our government is cancelling this program. Families don't want to subsidize a redundant program that ultimately results in longer lines, more paperwork when renewing their license plate or purchasing a new vehicle, and costly, unnecessary car repairs. To the minister, what other benefits can Ontarians expect from this announcement? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, 
from Etobicoke Centre, and thank you for the question. Uh, she's quite right. Last Friday, Premier Ford announced the cancellation of Drive Clean. Uh, this was a program that was costing two million Ontarians time, uh, two million Ontarians who had to do unnecessary tests and paperwork, and over forty million dollars of taxpayers' dollars. Now, this is something that the uh, the PC caucus in opposition was very clear in its opposition to at least five years ago. It, it took that long, Mr. Speaker. It took, it took this government to act on Drive Clean, um, a program that was effective at reducing emissions in the 90s, but that lost that effectiveness when standards for cars, cleaner gasoline, and older cars came off the road. Um, as the, member, the Auditor General stated, and as the founder of Drive Clean talked about, it was time for the program to be phased out, and it has been. Mr. Speaker, this government will Bonds. always be looking at programs, looking to balance a healthy economy and a healthy environment. And and where the programs are not supporting the, uh, the, either of those objectives, they'll be phased out, and programs that do work. Thank you. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister. I know my constituents in Etobicoke Centre and all over the province will be more, and ha more than happy with this development. Mm -hmm. The Toronto Star has polled over 20,000 readers. 66 per cent of partic participants believe that Drive Clean is an outdated program and cars are built differently now. Cancelling this outdated, inefficient program is going to save $40 million per year. Wow. I know my constituents approve of getting rid of waste. Here. I know it is important to my constituents that Ontario continue to be a leader, to care for our environment, and do so in an effective manner. Can the minister tell us what the future of Drive Clean looks like and how our government plans to continue to reduce emissions and protect the environment? Minister. Mr. Speaker, as uh, Toronto Star readers and Ontarians said very clearly, uh, the time for Drive Clean was over. But that does not oh, mean, uh, mean the end. To, uh, to important on-road testing. So, in the place of this program that, as uh, I've noted, has been ineffective for a long time, uh, we will be first of all winding down the program in an orderly way over the next six months, and then a program that will be focusing on the big emitters today, heavy trucks, uh, the people who are, are using diesel fuel uh, in those heavy vehicles, will be put into place. These are the emitters that the University of Toronto Engineering School and other experts say should be the focus today, and I could Sense. share with the, the House that I spoke to the head of the Ontario Trucking Association today who agrees. Um, good trucking industry participants don't want to pollute, but there are some that do. So that program will come into place. Once again, we will be taking programs that are ineffective, putting in program, taking them out of, out of play, putting programs that are effective into play, protecting the environment and protecting Once. the economy. Thank you. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Lesbian and gay Canadians are twice as likely to experience violence when compared to heterosexual Canadians. That number jumps to four times for bisexual Canadians and is even higher for trans and two-spirited community members. That's why the LGBT community eagerly welcomed Canada's first LGBTQ community legal clinic set to open this fall. But under this new government, funding for the EGAL clinic is no longer there. Shame. Will the Attorney General let our community know if the clinic is going to be more collateral damage as a result of this government's cuts? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I thank the uh, member opposite for the question. Ontarians deserve to live free from the threat of violence and abuse. Uh, our government for the people is committed to uh, continuing to invest in programs that provide the supports to survivors and to those at risk of violence, such as emergency shelters, counselling, sexual assault centres and court-based victims and witness assistance. The government is currently looking at all programs and funding commitments, as you know, and more information on this will be available at a later date. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Attorney General. Last week, the Toronto Star asked the Attorney General's office if this clinic will receive the funding that was promised. The response from the office failed to confirm if this clinic is still on the agenda, and today's answer is no better. 
They say they're going to look at the evidence, and then we wait and we are delayed. After the third year of rising of hate crimes against the trans community, we have a premier who has refused to march in the Pride Parade, who has removed critical sex ed curriculum. And now this government is taking away my community's legal supports. What will it take for this government to stand up for the LGBTQ community? Right up. Thank you. Response, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I reject the premise of the question. The previous Liberal, Liberal government left our province saddled with a $15 billion deficit Shame. and over $340 billion of debt. The people of this province have services and programs and support they expect and they deserve. And it is our, the mandate of our government, as we have been saying very clearly for the past few weeks in this House, that we are reviewing every program because we know they have had an impact on people's lives. to the member opposite. We are reviewing the programs and we will re report back in due time. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Barry Springwater, Oral Medante. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, Northern Ontario has a lot to offer the provincial economy, and I know our government is going to make sure we unlock more of its potential. I also know that Minister Rickford is extremely qualified to lead this important file. He's already shown how strong his commitment to Northern Ontario and Indigenous communities across the province is, and I'd like to thank him for all the important work he's done already. Mr. Speaker, I know our government has been taking steps to open Ontario for business, so I'd like to ask Minister Rickford if he can explain some of the initiatives our government has undertaken to deliver on our promises to the people to show Ontario is open for business by Northern residents and Indigenous communities. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Barrie Springwater or Medante for his question and his interest uh, in this opportunity. It's true, Mr. Speaker, whether it's First Peoples, For the People, this government is committed to ensuring economic opportunities span this great province. We know what Northern Ontario can contribute, and in particular, we know what our, the contribution our Indigenous communities can make. That's why I visited Ochichegua, Babigo Inning, otherwise known as Dahl's First Nation. Regional Chief uh, Roseanne Archibald joined me, and we celebrated a $1 million investment from the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, in addition to a half a million dollars from Indigenous Affairs Ontario to invest in a business centre of excellence in this dynamic community. Mr. Speaker, they already have a great footprint in Kenora involved in integrated resource management, but now they have a business development center with anchor tenants paying rent, a training area, a conference center, Mr. Speaker, as well as space Bonds. dedicated to the development officers who work for Treaty 3 to generate business. Chief Lorraine Copenas said it best. Mr. Speaker, Dahl's First Nation is open for business. Hey, hey, hey. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Ms. Minister, for your answering the question and your response. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I know that our government is keeping promises to the people of Ontario, and I am proud that we and you have already delivered so much. I know that through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, our government is making even more important investments to support northern communities. I'm happy to hear that this weekend's announcement will have such a positive impact on creating opportunities for Indigenous communities in this province. Mr. Speaker, I know that additional investments through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation are ensuring Ontario is open for business. Can the minister please tell the members of this House about another way our government is helping the people of Northern Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, another busy latter part of the week in uh, Kenora, Rainy River. Uh, I travel a lot, and I know many of my colleagues do, but I had a unique opportunity uh, on Saturday, Mr. Speaker. I sat on the other side of the gate at this brand new airport in Kenora, and I said, uh, Kenora passengers, uh, destination for the world 
flight number one is about to take off. Now, Mr. Speaker, that's because we have a brand new airport there. Full credit to the f federal government for their contributions, but it was a difficult road there. That was a two-room uh, house formerly as an airport. It needed several upgrades over the course of time, Mr. Speaker. We were investing in perimeter fences for to prevent deer and moose from coming on the site. State-of-the-art runway, Mr. Speaker, and various other uh, equipment to keep that place safe. Yesterday, I was pleased to celebrate a half a million Response. dollars by NOHFC and some money to invest in making sure that that airport authority has a strategic response and that Kenora, Mr. Speaker, will be open for business. Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. A uh, question is for the Finance Minister. Uh, speaker, when the Premier was a Toronto councillor, he said, and I'm quoting here, we're going to be outsourcing everything that is not nailed down. One of his first acts as Premier was to commission a quickie report from a private consultant that recommended privatization and outsourcing. Thanks to privatization, Ontario is already locked into a 22-year contract with a private company that's embroiled in a massive money laundering scandal in British Columbia. Is the minister considering taking us even further down this risky and costly road by privatizing the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation? Minister of Finance. President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, uh, uh, through you to the member opposite, and thank you for that question. Mr. Speaker, the, the E&Y report uh, was commissioned so that we could do a deep dive into the previous government, uh, Liberal government spending. They went through 500,000 lines of data, which is a very deep review. And in that review, uh, we saw uh, that they completed on time and below budget. Mr. Speaker, there are lots of great ideas within that report. I'd encourage again that the members opposite read that report. Because within that report, it very clearly says that we should leave no stone unturned, yep. that we will look at all elements of uh, how to save the public money. Uh, there's been duplication and waste for a number of years, and we are very Once. encouraged that we have a blueprint and a path forward. Here, here. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, in 2014, the Conservatives were touting a white paper, and it said that in addition to selling off Hydro One and OPG, the government should, should, and I'm quoting here, move to wind down the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, privatize its lotteries, casino assets, and slots operations. That's the full quote. Do the Conservatives still believe that Ontario's lottery should be privatized, or can the minister assure us that this is a bad idea is completely off the table? Minister, President, Treasury Board. Yeah, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member. Uh, as, uh, as was noted uh, last week, the, uh, there is no mention of any privatization of any Crown Corporation within the, within the report. Uh, what I would say is this uh, with regard to any privatization. What it did say is that if there is a good business case, and Mr. Speaker, in my experience, if you uh, get one-time savings but forego lots of future revenues and prices go up, just like Hydro One, Maybe that's not such a good business case that we should be looking at, Mr. Speaker. Um, but the, uh, the, the, voted against it. the number one thing that we have to do is we have to take care of the people. We have to make sure that our fiscal house is in order. The parliamentary budgeter officer last week said that Ontario's fiscal situation is not sustainable. How are we going to protect Bonds. our services, hospitals, education? Uh, infrastructure, transit, if we don't make sure that we have sustainable funding. Mr. Speaker, we are not pro-privatization. We are pro the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is the Minister of Environment, Conser Conservation and Parks. On August 23rd, a letter to the editor was sent to Ottawa Sun advocating for the end of the pointless drive clean program. In 2015, drive clean cost Ontario taxpayers $89 million. Wow. But did anyone bother to check if the program was actually working? Certainly not the previous Liberal government. No. The Premier and Minister of Environment announced last Friday their plan to scrap the drive clean program and save taxpayer money. Can the Minister explain to the House why this government decided to cancel the drive clean program? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, 
Uh, our, our caucus has been calling for the elimination of the Drive Clean program for over six here, here, years. Here, here, here. Norm Sterling, the former PC Minister of the Environment and the founder of the Drive Clean program in 1999, has also, for almost 10 years, been calling for the elimination of this program. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the previous Minister of the Environment, the Liberal Minister of the Environment, lauded our decision on Friday. He said in a tweet, Drive Clean had little impact, so even the previous Liberal Environment Minister was calling for the elimination of this program. It was only under the leadership of our Premier, however, that this program was finally eliminated, saving Ontario taxpayers $40 million, saving 2 million Ontarians from the added hassle for a program that didn't work. We cancelled Drive Clean because it wasn't working. We will always balance a healthy environment and a healthy Fox. economy and eliminate programs that do not support either. Thank you. Thank you. First, take their seats. Members, take your seat. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for his answer and standing up for the Ontario taxpayer. It is clear that this government respects the taxpayers by eliminating an ineffective and obsolete program. During the election, our plan for the people promised to put more money back in people's pockets, and we are doing just that. However, my constituents also care deeply about the well-being of our environment for future generations. Can the Minister of Environment explain how we will ensure that the biggest polluters on our roads will continue to be penalized for polluting the environment? Minister. Mr. Through you to the member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, who I know is an effective advocate yeah. and in, on this issue and other issues. Uh, is he, uh, Mr. Speaker, as we've been clear, one of the focuses of our government is going to be crack down, cracking down on the biggest polluters, cracking down on the areas where we can make a difference, where we're, while we're balancing a healthy economy with a healthy environment, we'll be focusing on those who are polluting the most. And, and as the University of uh, Toronto Engineering Department study showed just this summer, it's the big trucks, it's diesel trucks that are currently contributing the most to the harmful emissions, nitrous oxide and, and others that are really affecting our environment. So while our government is getting rid of the inefficient, ineffective, and outdated drive clean program that the previous government sustained for so long. Our government will be focusing on those significant polluters, making sure that they get value for money. We protect the environment oh, while supporting plan. the economy. Very well. Thank you. That concludes our time for question period this morning, and I want to compliment all the members. I could actually hear every question was put and everyone responded. For the first time since the 12th of July. Thank you very, very much. Point of order, the member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I regret to inform the uh, chamber that Peter Adams, who served in the 34th legislature, passed away on Friday. There'll be a memorial service held in Peterborough on October 13th at 2 p.m. at St. John's Anglican Church. I'd like to have uh, the thoughts and prayers of all of the, the members uh, thinking of Peter's wife, Jill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Point of order, the member for Scarborough, Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker, for the opportunity. I've been uh, getting notes on the colour of my jacket today, Speaker, and I just wanted to say that I'm wearing orange today because yesterday was Orange Shirt Day, and it's an opportunity for us to reflect on uh, the effects of residential schools and the reconciliation effort that is still ahead. Thank you. Do you have a point of order? Point of order, the member for Richmond Hill. Good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. Today is the national day for the celebrating the 69th anniversary for the founding of the People Republic of China. There will be a flag raising ceremony at the South Lawn. I'd like to invite all the members to join us at noontime at the South Lawn. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the amendment to Government Notice of Motion No. 8 regarding allocation of time 
on the appointment of a select committee on fiscal transparency, call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
interrupt these friendly cross-party discussions, but we do have to vote. <laughs> Members, please take your seats. On September 27, 2018, Mr. Vantoff moved the Government Notice of Motion No. 8 be amended as follows. In the first paragraph, the words, there shall be one hour of additional debate with 30 minutes apportioned to the government, 20 minutes to the official opposition, seven minutes to the independent Liberal Party members, and three minutes to the independent Green Party member. At the end of this time, shall be inserted following the number six, and in the second paragraph, delete the words 9C or. All those in favour of Mr. Vantoff's motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Ms. Shubhi Song. Ms. Shubhi Song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Shamanta. Ms. Shamanta. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Andrews. Ms. Andrews. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Rokosovic. Ms. Burns. Ms. Monteith, Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Madame De Rosier. Madame De Rosier. All those opposed to the motion will please rise and be counted by the clerk. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Bethlehem Falls. Mr. Bethlehem Falls. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Mulrooney. Mr. Mulrooney. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Yakubaski. Mr. Yakubaski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Fullerton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Miller. Perry Salmascope. Mr. Miller. Perry Salmascope. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Martin. Ms. Martin. Mrs. Trianta Philopolis. Mrs. Trianta Philopolis. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Cusandova. Ms. Cusandova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Uh, Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Samar. Mrs. Samar. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Smith, Peter Brokawartha. Mr. Smith, Peter Brokawartha. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tani Gasol. Mr. Tani Gasol. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Baber. Mr. Baber. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. The ayes are 38, the nays are 67. The ayes being 38 and the nays being 67, I declare the motion lost. Are the members now ready to vote on the main motion? No. I heard some noes. This matter will be placed on the orders and notices paper for further debate. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.